our second panel discussion. With us today is Mr. William Reinsch, School Chair and Senior Advisor, Center for Strategic and International Studies. We also have here from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, Mr. Stuart True, who's a senior researcher. And we're also hoping once, uh, once he's able to log on uh, from the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, Mr. Colin Robertson, Vice President and Fellow. So Mr. Ryan, uh, we will open the floor up to you. I believe you have an opening uh, statement. We'll give, you can have the floor for five minutes. Please yes, go I ahead. I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. It's an honor to appear before this committee. I'm testifying in my personal capacity and expressing my own views. The United States is currently entering a stage when Buy American is likely to play a greater role in federal government policy. And I do not see immediate relief for those who oppose that for three reasons. First is politics. Buy American has always been a popular slogan. <clears throat> and in last year's election, both our parties supported strong domestic procurement provisions. The voters the two parties are competing for largely white blue collar workers in traditional manufacturing sectors believe Buy American is an important policy that will create jobs for them. And President Biden seems determined to recapture as many of those voters as he can. Pursuing a more aggressive policy than President Trump did would be part of that effort. The second reason is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has brought to light gaps in our supply chains that led to shortages of critical personal protective equipment, among other things. Many of them were short-term and ultimately resolved through market adjustments, but U.S. citizens were left with the realization that we did not have everything we wanted at the moment we needed it, and the government wants to make sure that does not happen again. Uh, my understanding is that Canada is experiencing similar problems right now. In starting that process, the administration, to its credit, has not proposed autarky and has acknowledged that working with our allies and partners is the best way forward. The extent to which that is lip service remains to be seen. The result of the pandemic has been to refocus supply chain management on resiliency and redundancy. Managers need not only plan A, but plan B and plan C as well. And all those alternatives will involve more domestic sourcing or nearshoring. They will also involve some movement away from just in time manufacturing to rebuilding inventories. The third reason is related to national security and grows out of our deteriorating relationship with China. In the last 10 years, there has been a significant change in public opinion in the United States about China. In 2011, 51% of those polled had a favorable view of China and 36% a negative view. In 2020, those numbers were more than reversed, 22% favorable and 73% unfavorable. This change has been echoed in the US Congress where elected officials of both parties have pronounced China a security threat and vie to see who can take the hardest line against it. The debate has moved in two directions, running faster, improving our innovation capabilities and critical technologies to better compete with China, and slowing China down by restricting its access to US technology. Both strategies have involved efforts to reorient supply chains away from China, sometimes by banning the use of Chinese equipment in the United States, as in the case of Huawei, and sometimes by encouraging companies to decouple from China and return manufacturing onshore. At the same time, U.S. companies have been shortening their supply chains for reasons unrelated to U.S. government policy in response to political uncertainties in some countries, rising wages, or a desire to reduce transportation times and to be closer to their customers. The sharp economic downturn in the spring of 2020 due to COVID accelerated that trend. All these factors have combined to push companies to restructure their supply chains in ways that favor domestic production. In addition, it appears the government will attempt to change its procurement rules further to favor domestic production. That will be a complicated undertaking, in part because 96% of federal procurement is already domestic. That number is a bit misleading because we treat some parts and components incorporated into a product as domestic, even if they are imported. Changing that methodology will force some manufacturers to adjust their supply chains to include more U.S. content. Federal procurement contracts for goods in fiscal year 2019 amounted to uh, 231.4 billion US dollars in spending, a relatively small amount compared to the size of the US economy. The larger economic impact is likely to occur with respect to supply chain adjustments that US companies make either on their own or as a result of government pressure. There, the key issue will be how we define national security. There were officials in the Trump administration who defined it very broadly, and a glance at President Biden's supply chain executive order shows, shows similar breadth. He has ordered urgent studies on four critical sectors, semiconductor manufacturing and packaging, batteries, critical minerals, and pharmaceuticals. But he has also ordered year-long studies of major sectors of the economy, 
the defense industrial base, public health, information and communications technology, energy, transportation, and agriculture. Taken together, these sectors amount to nearly 60% of US GDP. If all the studies recommend actions to reorient supply chains to the domestic economy, the administration's policy will have a significant Im impact. Finally, as an American, it is not my place to suggest what your government might do with respect to US policy, but nevertheless, I'll make some suggestions. Uh, first, the premise of NAFTA was to further integrate the three North American economies, uh, and I believe it succeeded. Economic integration on our continent, particularly between Canada and the United States, is inevitable. And it would be useful for your government to continue to remind ours of that imperative from time to time. Instead of buy American, we should be buying a North American. Second, since our security interests are closely aligned, we both cooperate, where we both benefit from close defense cooperation. Canada could also work with the United States in developing a definition of national security uh, that does not overreach and sweep into the domestic procurement pot uh, a lot of things that shouldn't be there. Third, the Canadian government could remind the United States of its obligations under the WTO government procurement agreement and of its obligation to provide compensation if it limits other nations' benefits. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you very much, Mr. Reinch. And now, Mr. Chu, you have the floor for uh, five minutes, please. Hey, thanks very much to the chair and to the committee for this chance to speak to you about um, the Biden, Biden, plans, uh, Biden administration's plan to tighten up the Buy American and Buy America rules. Um, a bit about me, I currently direct the Trade and Investment Research Project at the CCPA, which has uh, been doing public interest research uh, into Canadian trade and investment policy since uh, the late 1990s. And I've split this presentation up today into three parts. The first gives some context on the Buy American policies themselves. The second is on, I think, how we shouldn't respond. And the third is on how I think we should respond to this moment. Um, the first point, you know, Buy America is here to stay. Uh, as committee members know and have heard from other witnesses, Buy American, Buy America, and other domestic preferences on U.S. procurement have existed for some time, and then they they enjoy a broad bipartisan support. Buy American policies require federal agencies to favor domestic end products or, do, or domestic construction materials when procuring goods, except in situations where it would be impractical or overly expensive to do so. Uh, for example, if buying locally would be more than 25% more expensive uh, than the lowest qualifying foreign bid, or where there's no domestic supplier, the agency can waive the Buy American requirement at the, at the federal level. Um, Buy America, uh, in contrast, or, or not in contrast, but uh, the, the, the state level uh, element of it, uh, these policies refer to a slate of domestic content statutes and regulations in which federal funding for state and local governments, mainly for transit and highway projects, but also uh, water infrastructure, uh, comes with domestic content quotas. So these quotas generally relate to the use of American iron and steel, certain other manufactured goods, or they could apply again to the value of components in things like buses and rail cards uh, for public transit projects. Um, so as the committee has heard, while many Buy American measures at the federal uh, level in the US are generally waived uh, by regulation, not by statute, for Canada and other member countries to the WTO agreement on government procurement, Buy America transfers to the lower levels of government are completely excluded uh, from the US GPA coverage, even for the uh, 37 states that have made other procurement commitments in that agreement. Um, the longstanding measures are standard operating procedure in the US, no matter who's in office, and the US is well within its legal rights to continue them. We have very little leverage, in other words, uh, to, to change these policies. I think the main unknowns, as this committee has already heard, is um, you know, what exactly are the Buy America conditions that will apply in this specific new stimulus plan? And how does he plan on changing or tightening up these waiver application process to make sure, in, or in response, I should say, to criticism that the Buy America contracts have been going to foreign firms? So I think we have to uh, put in there that mainly the focus is seems to be on China with respect to this specific uh, aspect of the Buy America contracts. So how should we not respond? I think um, looking back at the Obama administration days when they passed their own Recovery Act a decade ago uh, with strings attached, Buy America strings, we, we tried to negotiate a bilateral procurement agreement that would be balanced, and it didn't, it didn't go well. Um, the end deal announced in 2010 was hugely lopsided in favor of the US. Uh, Canada largely opened up provincial and local government procurement to unconditional US bids in return for a tiny sliver uh, of, of opportunity to, to bid on uh, stimulus money in a handful of federal projects. So these, this wasn't guaranteed access, obviously. It was an opportunity to bid on those what was left of the money that had already been spent. 
Um, it amounted to about four to five billion dollars worth of what was initially a 275 billion US uh, procurement fund. So not a great deal at the end of the day. Um, Canada has since made permanent commitments in the WTO GPA to restrict provincial procurement flexibility and bilateral commitments with the EU to permanently cover municipal procurement. Um, US firms with presence in Canada benefit from both of these um, agreements already. And as a result, we have very little to offer the Americans in a new procurement deal. You could offer them the CETA plus arrangement with municipal coverage, but that's exactly what we did in the COSMA negotiations and they weren't interested. And I suspect the Biden administration wouldn't be interested now. So instead of fretting over, uh, instead of a new deal uh, or fretting over what Canadian products or components may or may not be excluded from Biden's new Buy America plans, um, I think we should recognize that these same products and components, as this committee's already heard from other, other witnesses, steel pipes, concrete, rail cars, buses, they're needed here in Canada as well for the same purposes, right? Transit, renewable power, broadband access, infrastructure, water in particular. Uh, the AFP at the CCPA recommends we spend $36 billion over the next eight years uh, on, on new water infrastructure because we have a huge deficit in, in that area. Um, and if we're going to spend the money, which I think we should, why not take a page out of the Biden's playbook and find ways to channel some of that money to domestic manufacturing, local small and medium-sized enterprises, women-owned businesses, indigenous-owned businesses, et cetera, uh, with all the spillover benefits that that would produce in Canada and the U.S. So in summary, I would say sustainability criteria on federal transfers to the provinces and territories that prioritize high-quality, sustainable Canadian goods and services uh, may even bring the Biden administration to the table to discuss, as we just heard from the previous witness, uh, a potentially beneficial, mutually beneficial North American greed jobs and procurement strategy. So also happy to answer questions and thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chu. We're still trying to uh, get Mr. Robertson hooked online. So what we may do is we'll start with questions. And if he does uh, get a chance to come online, we'll just revert back to him. So for the first six minutes, we'll go to Mr. Straw, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'm having some connection issues myself here uh, in Chilliwack today, so uh, bear with me, please. My questions are for Mr. Reinch. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I think there certainly from at the Government of Canada level, there was almost a, a celebratory mood uh, when there was a change in administration. We, we figured that there would be a return to um, certainly a more predictable diplomacy, et cetera. And, and I think a lot of Canadians perhaps thought that a lot of the protectionist type of tendencies of the Trump administration would be immediately rolled back and we get back to the, you know, the, the good old friends who singing together and, and uh, cranking out deals uh, to the benefit of both countries. Do you see, you kind of alluded to it, it's been my uh, observation that so far, um, we actually we have made very few, if any, gains in terms of our relationship with the new administration in terms of policy initiatives that that would benefit Canada. We've seen the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline. We have another pipeline with Line 5 in Michigan under threat. We have no movement on softwood lumber uh, agreement that has, has not been signed. And now we have this Buy America uh, issue. Do, do you see any change other than uh, perhaps a friendlier and more predictable president? Do you see any change uh, from the Trump administration's protectionist measures uh, with the Biden administration vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with Canada? Or are we, are we just in for more of the same over the next four years? I think the, the answer would be uh, uh, not yet, but uh, I wouldn't lose hope because I think it's... Um, it's too soon to say where they'll come out on a number of these issues. Most of these things are, are, are under review. I, I can't speak to Keystone. That was not uh, an issue that we've done any, any work on. I'm a, a trade person. With respect to the other issues, I think uh, our, our, uh, the equivalent of your uh, trade minister, uh, Ambassador Tai, was, uh, only took office three weeks ago. Uh, issues like lumber are, are things that are under review, and I uh, I can't tell you that they're going to be the same as they were before. I think the um, there's, as you've noted, there's obviously a difference in tone uh, and a difference in, in rhetoric. There is a philosophical difference as well that I think will come out. Uh, President Biden is uh, a multilateralist in every sense of the word. He believes in cooperation. 
he believes in free, teamwork. Uh, President Trump was a unilateralist who believed in American sovereignty and was not interested in, in, institutionals, in institutions or cooperation. Uh, the, and that leads also to uh, the view that Biden looks at relationships holistically. So he looks, uh, Canada is not just about trade. It's about a whole range of issues, some of which you've discussed today. Uh, I think that works to uh, the benefit of the relationship and the benefit of the things that we're talking about in the long term. Uh, I cannot, however, say, you know, in the first, um, what, almost three months of uh, tenure that they've, you know, taken a, a bunch of actions that, uh, that should make you happy. Um, they have not. And I think with respect to domestic procurement in particular, um, they're unlikely to do so. When they were asked, when they produced their policy, someone asked them, what's the difference between you and Trump? Uh, and the answer was essentially, well, his didn't work and ours will. Right. Uh, so I'm not sure that's a good sign. Um, you mentioned uh, a, a number of, of issues there. We've we talked about the political reasons um, already. I think the two-year election cycle that the U.S. has makes it very difficult to to do difficult things uh, and have uh, have some time pass uh, before it, someone someone's always in a midterm or a, a congressional race or something makes it it's all very short term uh, in terms of of negotiating or or proposing uh, things on international trade. But I think there is um, some common ground here in what you're proposing. I think Canadians have recognized gaps in in our own supply chains, our own uh, manufacturing capability, et cetera. So I, I want to go to the to the the, the China uh, relationship. Is there an opportunity for Canada to be a part of a, a new international alliance, perhaps that is no longer reliant? I, I know Biden has gone. President Biden has gone down that road. But are, are we really going to all have to go down this road separately, or can we find a way to do this? Um, in a in a unified way, where uh, nations with common cause and and common values can can perhaps create their own integrated supply chains and not all be, you know, looking out for our own uh, just just the national interest. What why why do we need to create all of this separately? Can we not do it in an integrated way, especially between Canada and the U.S.? I think his uh, his intention is clearly that. Uh, it's clearly to develop a coalition and a common approach toward China, uh, and Canada uh, would be an integral part of that. Uh, my understanding of their their views on China is they intend to take the next year, essentially building the kind of co coalition uh, that you're talking about. Uh, and uh, we are not, at least at CSIS, looking for major changes in our China trade policy um, in the interim. I don't think things that are in place will go away but I don't think there will be new things arriving. I think they intend to work with our allies first to see if we can get everybody on the same page uh, and then try to tackle the problem collectively. And my final question is about the, uh, the, uh, the tax that has been proposed by the, uh, the Biden administration on, um, I guess, worldwide U.S. corporate income as part of the uh, as part of his infrastructure plan. Um, do you think that will, will that have uh, a, uh, the same impact as by America, or is it a? It, it's a separate tool. Obviously, it's. Uh, could could you speak briefly about what you feel that the impact will be on maybe reshoring uh, U.S. manufacturing um, using the tax system? The are you refer? You're not referring to the the proposal he just made to the OECD. You're referring to the proposal in his legislation. Yeah, the, the, that was a that was part of his multi-trillion-dollar infrastructure announcement. Yes, a good question. I think the it's a little bit too soon to say, partly because, as you know, if uh, those of you that work with tax legislation know, the devil's in the details, uh, and there is no legislation yet. There's only a, a a concept, so it's a little bit hard to say. I think the the uh, intent uh, would uh, uh, the effect would fall largely on American multinational companies that have already offshored their production. Uh, I think in the end uh, there will might be incentives for them to reshore uh, to come back here. Um, I don't see a large impact on non-American uh, multinationals. One of the criticisms of his proposal, which I've not analyzed myself, is that it may have the effect of, of encouraging inversions. Uh, corporate inversions, which is what uh, 
President Trump's tax bill attempted to stop and, and actually did stop uh, fairly effectively. It had other negative effects, uh, but it, it stopped inversions. And there's some feeling that uh, the Biden proposal uh, may be a step backwards in that respect. I don't see a major impact on, on non-U.S. Uh, multinational companies, though. Thank, uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Strahl. Uh, welcome, Mr. Robertson. Are you able to hear us? You're muted. We can give you some time if you want to. Uh, you want to take some time? No, I think is that better? It's better. Do you have a headset by any chance? Uh, unfortunately, my I, we had to switch. I've spent the last hour trying to get in, and I'm on my iPad, um, and the the uh, connection for the headset doesn't work. Although I could use. It, Maybe it, I'll just, use... it just it just makes it easier for the interpretation. Yeah, I'm just going to see if I can. This will work. Why don't we suspend for a few moments just to give Thanks. Mr. Robertson the chance? I understand you have opening comments. We'll give you five minutes to make your comments, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my experience with Buy America began in Albany in 1981 when my then boss, Consul General Ken Taylor, uh, we traveled to New York City from uh, to Albany to meet with then Governor Hugh Carey to push back on Buy New York policies on steel and cement, an experience uh, that over the years I would repeat in different states and on Capitol Hill. Protectionism through preferential procurement policies for goods and services is not particular to the United States. They are practiced by all nations, including Canada, and at every level of government. If all politics is local, so is trade. Voters prefer that their tax dollars be spent locally, even though buying local uh, generally costs more and provides less choice. But these uh, are economists' arguments. They don't matter much to the public. Neither does the belief that Canada deserves an exemption from Buy America because we are America's friend and neighbor. While polls consistently show that Americans like Canada more than any other nation, in fact, more than we like them, the business of America is business. So we've learned to deal with Buy America policies on five, four levels. First, by negotiating a procurement agreement within our trade agreements, like with defense production sharing, at the Trump uh, administration's insistence, there is no procurement chapter in the current Canada-US-Mexico agreement, yet much of what uh, was included in the NAFTA is included in the WTO plurilateral agreement on government procurement. But um, there are more likely to be uh, deletions from the entities list uh, in this agreement, given the current protectionist mood on both sides of the aisle in Congress and the Made in America approach of the Biden administration. Second, offer reciprocity in procurement at the state and province level, because that is where the money is spent. This is how we dealt with President Obama's Recovery Act program in the wake of the 2008-9 recession. Prime Minister Harper turned to the Premier's Council of the Federation, Premier Jean Charest and his successor as chair, Premier Brad Wall, reached out to their governor counterparts, including a trip by seven premiers 
to the National Governors Association in February 2010 to make the case for reciprocity. The arguments that the premiers made then still apply. By opening to outside vendors, local cartels' ability to gain the market was curtailed. Competition means better value. Most states are constitutionally prevented from running deficits. Governors need to make their dollars count, especially as they face huge costs in public services because of the pandemic. The 2010 Procurement Reciprocity Agreement did not include every state nor cover every sector, but it did open procurement opportunities for Canada. Third, working with labour is vital. When our unions are part of the negotiations, as we saw during the Cusman negotiations, we make progress. The United Steelworkers lead the charge for Buy America, but their membership is, on both, Canadian, is both Canadian and American. In the early 90s, uh, we gained respite from Buy America on Steel because then Trade Minister Michael Wilson went to Washington but then Canadian Steelworkers National Director and later uh, Steelworkers President, Leo Girard, and after talks with Steelworkers President, then Lynn Williams, the administration agreed that Buy America would not apply. Fourth, with those Americans we buy from and sell to, we need to make permanent our campaign that making things together is mutually profitable for jobs and prosperity. Look at our mutually profitable integrated auto trade. Four are cars assembled, its parts have crisscrossed the border at least six times. Car assembled in Canada contains 60% American made parts, often from Canadian, manu Canadian manufacturers with new operations like Magna, Martin Ray, or Linamar. We need to underline that our regulatory standards, especially labor and environmental, are commensurate with those of the United States. We also need to avoid the tyranny of small differences that keeps us out of the US market. Given America's growing national security concerns about reliable supply and resiliency, we need to point out that we are their closest ally and the source of their energy independence, including the critical minerals required for next generation manufacturing. When it becomes an American issue with Americans who want to preserve their supply chains, we increase our success rate as we witnessed with the renewal of the Trump tariffs, or sorry, with the uh, uh, dismissal of the Trump tariffs on steel and aluminum. To conclude, there is no magic bullet for Buy America. Hoping for an exemption because we are Canadian won't work. We need to make our case around reciprocity and better value while underlining the security of our mutual beneficial supply chains. Buy America is not going away, so making our case must be a permanent campaign, a Team Canada effort involving the Prime Minister and Premiers, Cabinets and legislators working with business and labour. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Robertson. We'll now go to Mr. Oliphant for six minutes, please. Uh, thank you to all the witnesses, and I just... I uh, want to begin uh, from the last panel uh, that, that Mr. Hoback mentioned, the important role of um, uh, parliamentarians in uh, the negotiation of the, uh, the new NAFTA deal. And I want to echo that. Um, even as the chair of the Public Safety Committee, I led a delegation and uh, very much chose the Conservative Vice Chair, uh, Tony Clement at the time, uh, to co-chair every meeting that we were in as we met legislators in the United States, uh, because he had much more experience than I did. And uh, the two of us were able to do that. And I think, as uh, uh, Mr. Hoback was mentioning, and, and uh, uh, Matthew, um, um, what was Matthew's name, Brian? Um, not Dubois. Had, anyway, yeah, we had a couple Matthews. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> Matt, Matthew okay. from from the NDP, uh, yeah. who's a good friend, and and it was a very successful thing. Bipartisan, and very very kind of you, Rob. What what we were doing in though that time, I think, Dubé. and I wouldn't Matthew Dubay. Matthew Dubay. Sorry, yes. Um, don't tell him I forgot. Um, I would take exception with Mr. True's. Um, absolutely sort of nihilistic view of uh, Mr. Harper's attempt with the Obama um, a situation uh, in, in his Buy America program. It wasn't a good solution, but I'm not sure it was as horrible as, as, uh, as some of the labor unions suggested. But I think our approach with the new NAFTA was much better because it was much uh, much less partisan. It involved labor unions. It involved uh, senior leadership uh, from the Conservative Party, the NDP. It involved business. It involved premiers. And I think, obviously, I'm just going to start out by saying that needs to be our approach this time. We need to have a, a broad-based approach. 
Uh, I'm appreciating that it's not going away. I think Mr. Robertson was very right. This is something here to stay. I think all the witnesses have said that. So now I'm looking at if it's here to stay and we need an all party approach and a multi-level approach, what are our levers? Um, I was astounded when I spoke to American legislators at the lack of information and knowledge they had about their dependence on the Canadian economy and Canadian supply chain. I was astounded that they didn't know about the integration of our manufacturing sectors. I was astounded that they didn't know the dependence that United States had on certain, not only our natural resources, but other sectors. Information has got to be part of it. Leverage though, what, and I, I would like all the, the uh, witnesses we have to comment on what levers do they think we as a Canadian um, government, a Canadian parliament can, can bring to bear, knowing that we start out with the position that a strong American economy and a strong Canadian economy are not mutually exclusive, they're interdependent. So uh, open it up maybe to the order you spoke in, uh, Mr. Reinch first. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oliphant. Um, <clears throat> Let me begin by saying that uh, having worked in, in Congress for 20 years and then served in uh, the Clinton administration and then in the private sector, I've seen this issue from multiple angles. And I can tell you uh, with confidence that uh, your government, uh, regardless of which party is in power at the moment, um, and your embassy uh, has over the years done an absolutely superb job of providing uh, the United States uh, Congress with exactly the information you're talking about. Uh, that doesn't mean that they pay any attention to it or that they read it, uh, but uh, your government has been diligent in, in developing the information that demonstrates the linkages that you're talking about. Uh, and I guess my first point would be to say, keep on doing that, because uh, one of the things that uh, I think one learns in politics is that repetition is, uh, is an important uh, element. You have to keep saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, and with uh, our con uh, Congress people, I think it's important to do that. I think also to do it in the way that you re referred to in your remarks, uh, uh, to do it personally, which of course is more difficult now, but won't be forever, uh, to uh, do it personally in uh, uh, direct contact with uh, legislative colleagues in the Congress uh, is very, very effective. Uh, forming relationships, forming personal relationships, forming cross-border relationships, uh, is uh, also effective. The information is there, the information is available. Uh, I mean, these are teachable moments, but uh, we also have, have to have learners. And uh, sometimes you have to just keep pounding it in over and over again. Wish I had something more brilliant, but I don't. Thank you, um, Mr. Truachant. Sure, Th thank you, Mr. Elephant for the, uh, for the question. I'm, I'm not sure I would, um... I would say our assessment of the Buy America, of the first Buy America deal was uh, nihilistic. I think it was I think it was uh, not quite the right word. But in terms of the leverage we have um, now with the Biden administration, I mean, I, I would say we should be working with them where we can. Um, and so, where we see Biden saying he wants to reform uh, these procurement rules at the WTO, for example, to make it easier for all governments to to use public spending in these ways to support domestic uh, priorities, for example, whether it's uh, renewal in the case of this post-COVID recovery, whether it's job creation, those kinds of things. Um, that's an area where we could work with the Biden administration to reform the trade agenda, as we kind of did under uh, the Trump administration with respect to investor state dispute settlement, where we've kind of started to come up with a new thinking around ISDS that maybe we don't need to be included in these agreements, maybe the harms to uh, Canadian, uh, you know, the threats to Canadian environmental policy and other measures, as as Minister Freeland mentioned, when we uh, when we signed the deal, saying it's thank God we got rid of ISDS, now we can actually have more flexibility around these policies. So, I mean, I would I would encourage us to work with the Biden administration on these interesting areas where we can put these things like sustainable development and trade into a more uh, a better balance than perhaps they are now. Thank you, Mr. Alton. I'm sorry, we're we're over time. We will now go to Monsieur Savard Tremblay. Vous avez six minutes, s'il vous plaît. You have six minutes. 
Thank you. Greetings to all the witnesses. Thank you for being here and for your testimonies today. Mr. True, I was listening very carefully to what you said, and I also read your text, which is very interesting. I like when ideas uh, are a little bit outside of the box. I appreciate the ideas that you propose and going more towards environmental partnerships. And you described this cycle where we uh, cry foul for protectionism, but there's no point because uh, we just end up filing uh, complaints, complaints and then the cycle just continues. I'd like to ask you. You proposed some things, and I'd like to know in more concrete terms, what would you do? You talked about a Buy America and a Buy American and how that would apply to Canada with the idea of coming to uh, buy a North American approach with the U.S. Can you talk to us about that in a little more detail? Um, I, I actually, this, we talked about the steelworkers recently. The steelworkers have done some good work on this through Blue Green Canada. Um, they have a proposal for sustainable sustainable purchasing um, at multiple levels of government, and it would factor in things like the carbon emissions of you know Canadian cement versus international cement or steel or aluminum. Uh, as the committee has heard, we have some of the cleanest aluminum um, and, and steel in the world, and so you know applying those kinds of criteria would in in effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, favor local production, local jobs, local workers, um, without running afoul of our trade obligations, which, as 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 I think as I think you know, um, you know, currently prohibit those kinds of, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of clauses. So that's one one angle that I think we could uh, we could think about in terms of sus sustainability criteria versus explicit by local by Canadian criteria, which are prohibited under uh, a lot of Canadian trade deals. Thank you for your answer. You also talked about enhancing partnerships, environmental partnerships. So this would be a procurement uh, procurement market. So the, both countries would open up their procurement markets on, for example, renewable energy. So public contracts that would be connected to renewable energy and then businesses would be on equal footing. That being said, we would each want to favor our production, even if the renewable energy market is very interesting for the environment. Isn't there a risk of falling into a something like the lowest bidder? Yeah, on, on things like uh, renewable power, I think I heard Mr. Verhul uh, propose that this was an area where we might be able to get some kind of sectoral arrangement with the United States. So rather than a full-on waiver for everything, which is probably unlikely outside of the uh, the Buy American uh, policies, which in many cases where we would have a waiver, um, you know, thinking about how do we negotiate something with the Biden administration in a sector like that, you know, I, I don't think in this environment where certain uh, of these these trade rules that were once considered strict and unmovable are now all of a sudden, I think, uh, you know, quite movable when we've seen where the Biden administration is going. I wouldn't rule out ideas like production sharing, you know, like maybe an auto pack type arrangement where we can agree to share uh, the production of these things that we know we need to, to build quickly and roll out in order to decarbon, uh, you know, decarbonize our economy and get people working. So. Anyway, just, just another idea uh, in terms of the different ways we can think of uh, climate, uh, jobs, and trade policy now. Indeed. Uh, sorry for the noise. This approach would definitely merit some further study. You also talked about good regulatory practices. We had raised this with others during KUSMA when it first was put on the table. Do you think that we should seek some kind of waiver to for this aspect of KUSMA in the case of bilateral discussions between both countries, for example? 
I, th I think if I understand your question with re it's with respect to the good regulatory practices chapter of the of the USMCA or the COSMA, um, I I suppose we'll have to see how that chapter works out in the end. Um, you know, there have been uh, concerns raised by some U.S. business uh, around Canada's plastics management plan, how this might violate that chapter. Um, you know, whether they pursue that, if they end up pursuing that, then maybe we do have to think about some kind of official as you say, some kind of official waiver from, you know, the chapter itself, because that seems like a pretty excessive use of, of the chapter to challenge something like, you know, a government's plan to reduce the uh, single use plastics in the environment. Um, but, but I don't have any specific, uh, haven't thought about it uh, too much, but it's an interesting question. Well, in the, in the very least, we'll have to study that further. On, on dit que sorry, mon sorry. Est I'm being told that my time is up. And for this next six minutes, we'll go to Mr. Massey, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for our witnesses to be here. And uh, just a general question with regards to everyone right now, and what I was trying to get at in the previous witnesses, and Mr. Oliphant raised it, you know, what his delegation did it helps my riding for Windsor West, where I'm on the border here with 40% of our trade, all kinds of different culture, social issues. And what I was trying to get to the last panel was that Right now, we don't have a border task force that includes, um, you know, the private sector unions, civil society, and so forth to work on our border policies. Sometimes they get entangled, and some are outdated. Some need tweaking, and so forth. And with COVID, it's even more complicated. And the point being is that, um, you know, the cabinet and the order and council is very secretive. There's no minutes. There's no uh, provision for the public to have full access to documents and to see what's going on and what's being on the put on the table, what's not. I don't think that's a helpful process right now. And so my question is, like, and, and a good example is that Mr. Sarai and I have been in the United States lobbying, Ms., Mr. McKay and I have been to so many meetings over the years, and Mr. Hoback and I um, as well too, covered tons of ground in Washington, opening up doors and creating conversations the government wouldn't even have access to because they just don't have either the people there, or they don't have the diversity because they don't represent all of Canada. They represent the political party in power at the time. So my question is general, maybe starting with Mr. True and going across the board here, um, would it not make sense to have some type of a working group or working model that actually had some type of accountability and openness to the public? I have so many concerned citizens that I can't see their relatives or families and they have no idea other than month by month what to go by. And they're not asking for things to be unsafe. And then we have issues like our mold makers who are very particular industry that are left behind. And then we have all series of other types of measures in place that could actually require some tweaking that could build stronger economic ties more efficiently. So Mr. True to you, um, is and, it, and don't if you think it's a bad idea, say it. I don't mind. It's not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a good idea to me. And and you're you're the expert on this, uh, Mr. Ross. Um, I would add, you know, like you, I think you maybe you you mentioned them, but municipal governments to that mix as well, because yeah. when we especially when we're talking about procurement, um, this is an area where we saw during the CETA negotiations, for example, that there was widespread uh, opposition among municipalities to being included in that agreement. Uh, and permanently bound to those those GPA rules now on on government procurement. So make sure they're in there, uh, and 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 that could be quite exciting. I think it's a good idea. It's a great suggestion. Anybody else? Um, yes, I uh, I don't want to uh, I don't want to tell you it's a bad idea, uh, but I will won't, won't tell you it's a good idea either. Um, over the years, I confess I've become um, uh, cynical about structural solutions. I think. Uh, uh, structures are things you create when you don't know what else to do, uh, and they don't necessarily solve the problem. They just create another forum to discuss solving the problem. Um, on the other hand, if you believe that uh, there's not insufficient transparency on border issues, then the solution you're talking about would have a favorable impact on creating more transparency. Second, if you believe that uh, your concerns are not being adequately uh, attended to in Washington, nobody's paying attention, you can't get the attention of relevant authorities, then creating a special structure uh, would probably uh, address that as well. Uh, you're a better judge than I am of whether those two needs need to be met. And, and that's a fair criticism about that. I, I appreciate that. One of the things I like to our former auto policies, we used to measure results and actually have measurement criteria specific for that every year as well we had that. So that's a very good advice. Uh, Mr. Robertson? Yeah, I think that uh, you know we've had a, a long a trade, trade screen when we crossed the border. After 9-11, we added a security screen. We're now going to add a health screen. I think we need to look at border crossings 
uh, regionally, there's some very good work being done by the Pacific Northwest Economic Region out there, pilots at, uh, as to how to make the border work better. There's something at the Wilson Centre going on. I think ultimately it's going to be the Prime Minister and the Premiers at their Thursday night conversations that will make the decisions on where we go. But uh, yeah, I do think it's an opportunity for us to also think about how we reimagine this border uh, given post-COVID. Uh, so I think, uh, yes, we should be looking at this and we shouldn't be bound by one size fits all. I think there may be a variety of things we can try opening it in certain parts of the, uh, because we, we have a massive border. It's not just the 49th parallel, it's also the border between Yukon and uh, Alaska. So uh, yes, I would agree with, with, with your approach. And one of the strengths that we've had is that even though we may not have the final decision as members of the Canada U.S. Parliamentary Association, we're chirping at people all the time and they're chirping back at their people all through the system and they're hearing it from several ways and getting issues you'd never think of before. I want to quickly move to Mr. True because you had mentioned with regards to almost a domestic procurement policy and that's actually something that I got advice from a U.S. former congressman. He's passed away, Mr. Obastar, uh, long representing transport committee person as well too and he's a very very good person in many respects he was part of our Canada US and he mentioned to me that we should consider a Can a buy Canada policy as part of uh, a negotiation tactic to push back a bit on some of these things uh, that might be more um you know seem real almost to the point they're silly between ourselves like digging up pipes and infrastructure and so forth is that what you're kind of suggesting a little bit is is that element and then I'll, I'll segue with there real quickly to why I think it might lead to actually, when I talked about the microchip uh, issue, is to partner on that, where we are domestically bound to China's production. And this is for a microchip that's necessary for a PlayStation to all that, to a minivan, um, to a toaster. I mean, this is the thing that we've put our vulnerability. Is, is is that the kind of the goal of maybe a domestic procurement that also could lead and open up dialogue to creating maybe some co-production for North America? Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, so a, a buy Canadian policy is probably out of the question at this point, given the commitments we've made uh, recently in, in the CETA and other agreements. Um, but but as we've been proposing and, and others unions have been proposing, I mean, there can be sustainability criteria attached to public spending that would have similar effects. Um, you can also think of perhaps Canada building on its uh, global leadership on uh, gender, uh, gender friendly trade, right, gender based trade where we look at how do we uh, bring more women-owned businesses into procurement oppor opportunities within Canada, right? I mean, that could be something that could, we could have something similar to a trade commissioner service, for example, but domestically to help small and medium-sized enterprises, women-owned businesses, indigenous-owned businesses, help them to find the procurement opportunities that are available across, the, across Canada, right? So the effect is you're helping these companies get into those opportunities, but you're not doing it with a strict buy Canadian. I agree that uh, I think the buy sustainable policy that had the same effect would potentially uh, bring the Biden administration to the table um, because it might have the effect of excluding certain American companies. But anyway. And, and some of that actually, their infrastructure projects over here, like we're building the Gordie Howe Bridge, something we've been after, for, I've been after in 1997. At any rate, the US actually has provisions to allow for access to minorities, women, and others that are disenfranchised historically through um, the economic system that actually get a portion or cut out or carve out. So I guess you're saying the same type of thing in some respects, and that wouldn't violate our policies because they're already doing it there. It, it it wouldn't strictly. I mean, we didn't we didn't seek uh, within the GPA, the WTO, a carve out for those policies like the U.S. has. We don't have a carve out for set asides for minority owned businesses or women owned businesses. I don't see that as a reason not to pursue them. I don't think um, uh, you know we we can't we shouldn't be avoiding risks like that, right? Uh, for for good policy. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, colleagues, uh, it looks like we have five minutes left, so I don't think we'll have a chance to go into the second round. So I will. Uh, no. Uh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just the, it's 4:55 now. It's, it wouldn't be fair. Everybody wouldn't have the time. So why don't I thank the witnesses on behalf of the committee? Thank you to uh, Mr. Runch. Thank you to Mr. Reinch, thank you to Mr. True, and thank you to Mr. Robertson for your uh, for your comments today and and sort of helping us sort of uh, discover more about this policy that the United States is is thinking of enacting. So thank you very much. On behalf of the committee, really appreciate your comments. Thank you to the committee, and uh, hope you have a great weekend. Bye bye.